Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. It's always fun to have someone who I've worked with on the podcast with me. Gordon Drummond is our guest today. Gordon is the president of Sessions College for Professional Design. Gordon and I worked together, I think, starting in the 20th century, if you'll believe that. We have lots to talk about, about design education, online education, a lot of the interesting work that Gordon's been doing at Sessions. Before we do any of that, I just want to welcome you to the show. Gordon, welcome to Trending in Education. Thank you, Mike. It's great to be here. It's an absolute pleasure to connect after all these years working together way back in our past lives. And yeah. I'm really excited to talk about Sessions College. Yeah. And Sessions is interesting on a number of fronts. It's an online college. It's been around for 25 years online the whole time. And, and then also it's focusing on design and creative work, which is something that is very much top of mind when you think about the future of work and some of the disruptions and the transformations that are happening, all things you're thinking about, I'm sure, at Sessions. Before we get into that part of the conversation, we always like to begin by getting to know you a little bit better. Can you share with our listeners how you got to this point in your professional life? Sure, I'd be delighted to. Like many folks in education, I think where I am right now is a result of multiple strands in my past. As you can tell from my accent, or maybe you can't, I'm originally from Scotland, and I have an arts background and education background that kind of explains how I got to where I am today. My father was a painter and an, an art teacher, and ultimately became the director of a, an arts college in my hometown in Scotland. And all my relatives were teachers. My, my mother, my uncle, my aunt, they all got me together at one point and said, Gordon, you, ha you have to do something, something different than education. And I tried. But ultimately, I, I did not uh, succeed in that endeavor because I kept on getting pulled back into education in different ways. When I was uh, much younger and you and I worked together, I was an aspiring musician in New York City. And I was drawn to the Big Apple by the fantastic music scene there and the desire to, to explore that. I went to a music college in New York, a, a fantastic experience. But also, I was working in education in various capacities. You and I were lucky to work together at Kaplan. Uh, which is a, a really interesting environment where I learned a lot about assessment, about creating content, about teaching, about training teachers. Uh, it's very much a creative company with a sort of incubator-like atmosphere. And then from Kaplan, I went to a company called Learning Brands, which was right at the cusp of the dot-com boom. We were creating educational websites to train companies' customers on concepts that were important to companies. So the idea was use the internet and use it to teach which yeah. is, of course, you know, one of the original purposes of the internet in the first place. And that, that led to Sessions College, which I joined in 2001. You know, I've been there for more than 20 years and uh, served in educational capacity. I was a director of education there, and I was ultimately fortunate to be asked to be president starting in 2011. And it's been a terrific opportunity. It's a, a wonderful institution, a very creative form of education, lots of great success stories along the way for students. And, you know, it remains an exciting space right now, even in 22, even when we're 20 years into the, um, the online education revolution. Mm -hmm. And you talked about your origin story and Sessions has a similar trajectory. It's been around long enough that it both has its origins, but then there's a lot of transformations that have happened over the years. So can you catch folks up a little sure. bit around what yeah. Sessions is and how you got, how maybe tell a little more of that story. Yeah, it's been uh, fascinating to see it evolve over the years. You know, I think Sessions College, now we are currently a fully online school of visual arts offering a range of programs from graphic design to web design to photography to illustration. And if you looked at us now, you might not guess where we came from, you know, and Sessions had sort of gone through several stages of evolution. It was founded in 1997. And the original concept of the school was to just offer courses, you know, over the internet to people all over the world. Around 2001, when the school was first accredited, which is when I joined, the school started to organize its content into programs that were career-based. So the idea was to offer certificate programs only on a self-paced basis to students. And the, the programs that were organized, sets of courses were designed to prepare you for careers like graphic design or web design. Mm -hmm. And we existed in that state really for the you know, from 2001 to 2008 as a post-secondary school, but emphatically not a college. The idea was we wanted to be more nimble, more 
flexible, you know, not to fall into the, the many aspects of being a college or, or the demands perhaps of being a Title IV institution. But very fortunately in 2008, our executive board made a decision, a smart decision in retrospect, to, to become a college. We felt that our programs were strong enough and the student outcomes were strong enough that we should be able to offer degrees. And then as soon as we started to think like that, a whole transformation took place, developed our first degree programs where we put together the steps to be part of the Title IV system so that students could you know, attend college and, and get grants or loans from the federal government in order to uh, study. That process started in 2008. We moved from New York City, where we started, to Arizona, to uh, Tempe in Arizona. And our first two degree programs are launched in 2010. And then, you know, over the last 10 years, we've added, we now have six associate degree programs, three bachelor's programs that we added over the course of the pandemic, a whole range of four credit certificate programs. And, you know, it's a very much a full suite offering. We're an institution of higher learning. And, you know, that's a long way from being a little boutique provider of courses located somewhere in Soho, New York. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if folks are curious, it'll be included in the show notes for this episode, but it's sessions.edu. You can check out everything that Gordon and team have going on. One of the things that has happened most recently is the massive transformations of the pandemic. I thought it was an interesting space for you to talk about because in many ways you were ahead of the curve and that you were already online. And then suddenly, you know, particularly 2020 into 2021, a lot of folks were scrambling to go online. You already were there. Thoughts on what it means to be online and any insights or perspectives that you've gained over the last two or three years? One of the strengths, I think, of us as an institution is that we were effectively born online. We didn't consider any other reality right mm -hmm. from the beginning. Most of the schools that are in our space that offer similar programs to us have created online campuses that are basically online versions of their classroom-based education. Yep. And I think they approach it very differently because they are thinking about the classes as a parallel to the classroom. And I think when the pandemic started, you saw some of the challenges in that. You know, what happened in March 2020 was that the entirety of higher ed and K-12 went online in a week <laughs> yeah. with mixed results because rightly, the educators, the schools were not prepared for that change. And, you know, my wife, who's a writer and she's also a teacher, I remember coming home that week and saying, well, okay, so we're, we're going online from now on. And I said, well, okay, what training have they given you? And she said, um, here's my Zoom password. Yeah. So there wasn't a lot of preparation. The idea was, you know, put the teacher in the Zoom classroom, replicate the same face-to-face -face experience over Zoom that you would have in a physical classroom. And boy, was that not successful. I mean, it's already quite hard in higher education scheduling classes for like, you know, two, two credit hours or three credit hours with two hours of, or three hours of lecture a week right. in order to fulfill those requirements. It's doubly hard if you're doing it over Zoom because the interaction is a little bit less. That's not to say that Zoom is not effective, but just using it as the totality of your delivery is not, is not going to do very well. Right. And I think what we saw is like schools pretty quickly adapted and found different ways to deliver education where the face-to-face -face was supplemented by content and by assignments and other ways to learn. But, um, you know, that's very hard to do. It, it's well known that online education requires quite, quite a large investment. Mm -hmm. You know, the way that we approach online and have approached it from the start is to have certain things in place. Like we, we assume that education is mostly going to be asynchronous, mm -hmm. which means that there's, there are scheduled assignments that really put you through your paces and there's content and there are interactions with an instructor, but it's delivered in such a way that students across the country or around the world can participate and learn without having to be in the classroom at six o'clock on a Tuesday. And so asynchronous is part of it. Another part of it for us is that it has to be project-based right? and project-based learning means instead of trying to simulate concepts and kind of demonstrate your knowledge through, through written essays and other traditional assessments, it's more about attacking a series of projects that are designed to put you through your paces, to test your skills, to test your application of concepts to a scenario. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's a mode of education that we found to be very successful for adults uh, because it's closer to the application of the skills. Yeah. than a traditional classroom setting. Also, it's something that you can package and you can 
set aside and it's more flexible. So that, that's a benefit. And then the third aspect of what we do, which is, you know, not unique to us and it's traditional to all art design schools is that the learning is very much based on critique and feedback. Mm -hmm. So you're doing at these projects, you're designing a logo, you're creating a website, you're doing a photo shoot and you come back into the classroom and you submit your work and then you get feedback from a creative professional and they're able to see things in your work, uh, strengths and weaknesses that, that you can't see. That this is why you're in the classroom in the first place. Right. And you get the feedback and then you get the chance to resubmit your work and improve it for a better grade. And that's really key too, because, you know, in the creative space, nothing is ever right first time. And you're always doing creative work for clients or employers who expect an iterative process in order to um, arrive at the product or the result that they want. Mm -hmm. And that, that's true whether you're doing a, if you're a photographer doing a wedding shoot, or you're doing a website for a client, or you're doing a logo for a, a new business that's starting up. Mm -hmm. All of those things, you work with the client, you communicate with them. Their ideas and their feedback becomes part of the process of developing the product that they ultimately, hopefully, accept mm -hmm. and which delivers what they want. So the classroom, in a way, is a, an environment where you can rehearse those kinds of communications and build the feedback into your expectations of how you're going to work. And I like the language around professional design, you know, professionalizing your creative capabilities where, you know, we're all makers. I don't like when folks are referred to as creatives as though they're othering the non-creatives in the <laughs> yeah. world. But also yeah. if you have that spark of creativity, you're a maker, you can design things, professionalizing that, learning how to develop mm -hmm. your social emotional skills, your durable skills, your ability to work collaboratively, project-based yes. collaborative and portfolio building and doing all of that online for 25 years I think mm -hmm. that gives you, you know, somewhat of a unique perspective on the future of education and also how it relates to the future of work. Do you have yes. any thoughts uh, about that, where it does almost feel like the, the way your curriculum is designed and the way your students engage with it, in many ways, it has foreshadowed. And now in many ways, it is the reality that a lot of us are working professionally yeah. in a very similar context. I, I think that's absolutely true. We're now in this post-pandemic environment where many people are working remote. Many people need, need to be able to manage their roles and their positions and communicate and deliver a successful result for their remote client or employer. And, you know, creative, creative work has always been like that. If you look at the stats for the percentage of self-employed in categories like multimedia or graphic design or web design, it's always been an aspiration for people going into that field they, they weren't aspiring to, you know, work in a cubicle. Let's put it that way. <laughs> they were aspiring to maybe work from home and have flexibility and do jobs that they love versus jobs that they're, you know, to be able to pick and choose a little bit and pursue a creative path. That doesn't mean just being solely expressive <laughs> that, or, or individualistic about it. It means being able to work with, with clients and employers. So that is something that we try to build into the program. For example, in our BFA program, which we've just launched our first three programs over the last two years. We have an internship entrepreneurship class, which asks the students to engage with either, either in a physical workplace or on a remote basis with a client. Mm -hmm. And they, all the students go out and they, they're um, engaging clients or employers in their local community. They're drafting the project that's going to be accepted for the credit for the class over a 10 or 15 week period. And then they're coming back at the end of the term and they're reporting on their experience with the colleague. And it was important when we designed it because we designed this program during the pandemic that it was acceptable that the student could either be in a physical workspace like a traditional internship or remote because remote is just as likely to be the case mm -hmm. in the post-pandemic world. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I think there's a lot going on with online education right now, as you hinted at. And I remember hearing um, Richard Garrett from EduVentures give a presentation about 10 years ago. He's a very smart guy. He's talking about the commoditization of the early phase of online schools. And I think in the early phase of the big online schools, you know, schools like University of Phoenix, you know, the idea was like education is the value of it is that it's going to give me my credential to further my career, mm -hmm. but I don't necessarily expect it to be, you know, more affordable or better quality or a better experience than a classroom, you know, and that, that's just him characterizing the situation, not to blame any individual institution for that. But the idea was sort of online is going to be there, but it might not be as good, but at least I get my credential. Mm -hmm. Uh, his point of view, uh, which I totally agree with, and I think it's still true, is that online really will break through when it delivers all those things and more, 
Like what if online could be more affordable? Yeah. What if online could be just as effective or more so? And thirdly, what if it could be just as good an experience? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've always maintained the purpose of online is not to replace traditional classroom. We love classrooms, but as long as we're delivering online education, we should be delivering the most effective thing that we can and trying to push the boundaries to make it successful, to make it affordable, to make it, to make the experience rewarding in different ways. I'm glad you brought up the student experience because that's the other place I wanted to dive a little more deeply with you. I know it's something you're passionate about. There's this concept around course design, particularly technology enabled course design, yeah. that it could be technology led versus technology enabled. And I fall prey to this all the time. I love nerding out on the blockchain or on AI or what, yeah. what VR, whatever the new hotness is, you know, it's a trend spotting show. We're going to talk about it. I yeah. know you have some strong feelings about how technology can empower the education, but also where the underlying thing that is conveyed is not necessarily about the medium. I'd yeah. love to hear a little more of your thinking about that. Well, sure. I mean, one way to answer that question is like, how do we keep pace with technological change? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I, we are a school that delivers courses which have technology built into them. So for example, if you're a creative pro, you're most likely using one or more of the Adobe suites of products, Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, and more. You know, de developing education to train people in those softwares has been a real, a real experience for us and it's really built into what we do. So there was a big thing that happened in 2015 when Adobe first made a transition from disk software to a cloud-based product that was available on subscription. It was a big thing in the, in the industry. Mm -hmm. And the industry started to go from annual updates to the software provided through disks and being limited by the supply chains as to when updates could happen to, to an environment where they could push updates in real time. And over time, that's really what's happened. Like Adobe has become a company that innovates continuously that uses the increasing power of the computer each year to explore new ways to deliver things. And right now, uh, one of the things that they're doing is introducing AI into all of their products. Mm -hmm. How this affects us as a school is that we have a, an annual cycle to review and update our courses. It's a challenging and exciting thing that the thing that we are training students in is continually changing. So therefore, what we do is every year there's a conference called Adobe Max where Adobe rolls out or announces the majority of its big innovations for the year. And what we do as a school, which I'm hoping all other schools do, is we meet with all our course developers and we review the changes and we think about how to integrate it to the course and we think about how it changes the outcomes mm -hmm. and we revise and we update within a period of two or three months, sometimes creating notices for students so that they can take advantage of the changes sooner. Yeah. So it's a, it's a constant challenge to keep pace with change. That's one thing that's really different about being an online school, mm. I think, because the student has an expectation that the software that they just downloaded is going to match the class that they're just entering. Yeah. And that's, that's a big ask, but it's something we've committed to and we're trying to fulfill. On the AI side, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. I mean, so Adobe with its products is entering this interesting new era where they're making AI-driven tools available to uh, users of the software. An example of an AI-driven tool is, say you're, you're in InDesign and you're doing a layout and you're placing a photograph within the layout and you've got text, you've got images, you've got choices on layout. Typically, that would be a human that would make that decision. Where do I put the image? What is the right cropping of the image? How is the text going to flow around it based on all my other design decisions? Well, the AI is supporting the human decision-making now whereby you can place that image and you can see 10 other variations of it that the AI has suggested for you. So it's a very interesting time because this may, it's possible to create sophisticated designs where you're not sure where the human ends and the AI begins. Right. It's an interesting thing for creatives because you know we're at the same juncture in the evolution of technology that we always are where we're saying, well, we're trying to make things easier for humans, but at the same time, we don't want to take away the human's job. And could there be a point where this tool could just create the layout itself without having the designer make the decisions? Yeah. So Adobe is using the power of AI and using the power of computing to sort of assist the decision-making process. What we're doing as a school is to try to train our students on how to use these tools intelligently and preserve the, the parts of, the, of their role in this whole process that, that are still distinctive. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, it's, it's fascinating stuff, Mike. It's, you know, we're sort of at a cusp in the industry where we're working out how the machines and the, the humans work together and yeah. hopefully they, they can. Right, right. And then also in terms of the curriculum you design, there is a notion of deeper understanding under the hood, you know, like some of the technology might change, but if you are a web designer, for example, there is a conceptual understanding. There are other elements to your instructional design that are going to power whatever the version of, you know, Adobe Photoshop that rolls out. You're yeah. still teaching yeah. people the underlying skills and competencies, and you're also tapping into practitioners as your, you know, your instructional firepower. Can you talk about how that part works? Yeah. I mean, in our programs, there's a nice interaction between digital media and traditional media. Mm -hmm. So students will be learning, they'll be learning drawing and painting in some programs alongside learning Illustrator and Photoshop. And, you know, the challenges still remain for artists and designers. You know, you're, what you're trying to do is find a way to create polished artwork that represents the world, that presents a point of view that uses the fundamentals of design, which are our understanding of typography and color and layout. These are human things that somebody, you know, a hundred years ago or 50 years ago had developed into a system, mm -hmm. which was previously laid out in little, um, you know, metal blocks and printed on a, a piece of paper, mm -hmm. but now it's very digital. So I think one of the things we try to do is try to relate the things that you can do in these new tools to the traditional media so that students have a larger like a broader picture of what it is you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. And the other thing to say is like the, in spite of all the tools, it really is the thought process and the concept that is the, the first thing that creates successful work. It's not your ability with your mouse. Right, right. <laughs> it's your ability with your brain, plus yeah. your ability with your mouse that is going to en end up making you a successful creative. Yeah, yeah, frequently it, for me, it comes down to the distinction between skill sets and mindsets where you mm -hmm. need to learn both, but if you don't have the foundational mindset, uh, you know, the, the way to look at things critically, to develop your eye, to, to develop your artistic sensibilities, the skills on top of that are not necessarily going to work, you know, in a professional setting. And then you yeah. add to that the social dimension where ultimately you're going to have to be working with other humans to co-create meaning and yeah. to make sense of what you're doing. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, many students come into an art design school with sort of an idea of creativity being their personal style. And, you know, at the end of the day, there are only very few top artists and designers get hired for their personal style. Yeah. There are some examples like Milton Glaser, who's, you know, the wonderful New York based designer who passed a couple of years ago. All of his work was different. Every project was different. And he prided himself on the idea that his style wasn't recognizable because mm -hmm. he was approaching each project as an individual thing where he was trying to deliver something for a client. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of a student's trajectory, you'll see that. For example, in our illustration program, many students rightly, uh, uh, as young people are say inspired by anime. So they, mm -hmm. they, they'll enter the school with a portfolio full of, of anime ponies and big eyes and, you know, characters that are inspired by Japanese artwork or Korean artwork. And that's great because they've developed drawing skills. They've developed ability to kind of refine their craft on, in a very narrow sort of way. But what we're trying to do as they work through the program is expose them to how they would create different kinds of artwork mm -hmm. that's still, that's at a high level and that's geared to the individual demands of the project or the employer, assuming that they ultimately want to be professional. That's what they're going to have to do. Right. Yeah, exactly. And then the creative process as someone who lives and breathes it, you're also a musician. Our listeners might not all be in the creative space. They might not all be in a creative school setting. But increasingly, maybe it is partly the threat of AI and automation. We do need to lean into those aspects of our humanity that are uniquely human to yeah. kind of stay ahead of the curve. Do you have any thoughts on how you find inspiration or what you've learned by working with folks who are really constantly in search of that next new idea? The idea of being creative has never been more accessible. Mm. Thanks in part to the development of the internet, thanks in part to the accessibility of these tools. It's not to say that they're not complicated, but if you wanted to become a Photoshop artist or you want to be a photographer, or you want to make a movie mm. or launch a YouTube channel, whatever it is, 
it's never been easier to, to sort of figure out using the many, many resources that are out there, how to do it. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage anybody who wants to be creative to, to honor that part of you that says, oh, I really want to make a movie or I really want to, you know, I'd like to have some professional portraits done through photography or painting, whatever it is. We're, we're in a better place as a country if people are able, you know, to honor their, the creative side of their personality, because it, it tends not to be destructive. It tends to be a human thing that embraces the world instead of tearing it down. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's, there's a lot of talk lately about well-being and flourishing and living to your fullest potential as a human. Frequently yeah. that involves leaning into your creative self and following, following your passion while still having the guardrails of, I'm going to be a professional I need to continue to stay employed. Do you have any thoughts yeah. on that? Like the, the maker economy, the creator economy, the passion economy that's emerging. You mentioned a little bit the gig life earlier. It, it, it is becoming much more the norm. Yeah, it's always been a, an, an aspiration for our students. In our surveys for students as they enter the school, something between 25 and 30% of our students want to be freelancers. Yeah. And that's because of the appeal of doing what you love mm -hmm. and doing something creative. That's not an easy path in life necessarily, because as you know, as a freelancer, you need to cobble together clients, you need to develop relationships, you need to do as much promotion perhaps as you're doing the actual work in order yeah. to make your presence felt. It is a fulfilling life. It's, and it's, uh, it's something that makes us very happy as a school when we see a professional story with one of our students doing an exhibition or getting a gig or designing a book cover. That's just the most fulfilling thing because, you know, we're at the end of the day, as a school, we're all about the student succeeding mm -hmm. and unlocking that. You know, it's one of the pleasures of being in an online school is to do things a little bit differently. I always feel that, you know, we as an institution, we have many people in different roles. We have, of course, our faculty members, they're teaching our courses, but we have administrators, instructional designers and student services folks that are, that are looking after students. And all of us, we're all motivated by the idea of the student succeeding. And, um, you know, that's one of the things that in a smaller institution, that's a, a sort of a feeling that you can give to students and perhaps give them a little more personal attention and support than you could in a large institution that's running in, on a routine basis. Yeah. And I thought that was a, an interesting point of clarification too. Even though you are online, you're not massive and yeah. you are intentionally small and focused and there is an element of intimacy and connection that you get within that type of culture. Can you describe a little bit what your culture is like? Yeah, students get a ton of support in different ways. I mean, every student who enters the program, for example, gets a student advisor who is not just, the role is not just selection of courses or choosing my electives. It's uh, someone who follows your academic progress through the program with monthly follow-ups and interventions. And so the student always has somebody outside of the classroom who they can turn to if they're struggling, if they have mm -hmm. an issue, you know, with online education, it's much easier for a student to, to quit the education. Yeah. If you think if in a physical school, if you withdraw, you have to go into right. school, talk to the secretary, fill out the forms, go through the whole process. And it's a little bit harder to do online. You know, you can, you can walk away from the computer, right? <laughs> You're, so it's incumbent on us to really provide a support network and a support system for the students so that they, when they encounter these hard times, because everybody has things going on in their life that, that um, could potentially become more important than their program or their education. Mm. So we, we want to make sure that at all points we're, we're there for the student and, and to help them figure out how, how to continue if they can. Yeah, um, and, and that also connects to the affordability piece too, where you are intentionally affordable. The name of the college is Sessions College. That's and right. It's available at sessions.edu. We're getting closer to the, the future-facing conclusion of the, the show here. I'll, we'll close with your concluding Great. thoughts. But before we get there, I always like to get folks looking a little bit further out, say five, 10 years from now, anything you see on the horizon that you think is worth noting, anything capturing your imagination, anything you think may be on the horizon for design education, online education, what are you noticing these days? Well, it's going to be an interesting period. You know, we have, you know, what, what has been characterized as the, the enrollment cliff, which is the idea that traditional colleges are really all going to be competing for students, as the demographics start to suggest, that there'll be a smaller pool of college-going students. I think there's going to be competition between traditional schools and online schools. 
Mm -hmm. One thing encourages me, there was a, an article in Inside Higher Ed a couple of weeks ago that talked about how high school seniors and, and juniors were twice as likely to consider online mm -hmm. uh, after the pandemic as they were before it, which to me is very interesting because you know, you could, the conclusion they could have drawn from the pandemic is that online education doesn't work. But instead, the conclusion that, that there seemed to be drawing is to say, okay, in this changed new environment, online is potentially a viable option for me. Maybe it's a way for me to take program and continue my job and or not go into debt because it's more affordable, mm -hmm. because all of the ancillary costs that you have with traditional college are not there mm -hmm. with an online school. Yeah. So it's going to be a very interesting period. And for Sessions College, we're looking forward to continuing to expand our programs. We're very excited about our bachelor's programs. We want to be the kind of school that you could take an individual course for a semester, or you could take a four-year degree. You could take it, take as much, as much education as you like and have options at different levels, ranging from very scheduled to flexible. We're still a little known uh, school, even though we've been around for 25 years and we're accredited and we like to be just a better known brand for creative education. Yeah. And it'll be interesting to your point about higher education, how much of that perception among the rising generations is based on their experience of their high school education moving to Zoom on the one hand, which may yeah. have been a challenge and may have been a substandard experience. But then on the other hand, they're living on TikTok and Instagram and, you know, engaging in really rich content through yeah, they are. YouTube and Zoom. So like you, when you think about the broader context of those learners, the idea that they're more open to online education actually they, starts to make a lot of sense. You're, you're right on. You're totally right on. I mean, here we are online and your classroom and your browser tab is existing alongside TikTok, streaming videos, any kind of content or every kind of content that, that you are interested in. And you've seen evidence of high quality experiences and high quality content being delivered to you online. Mm. So, that, so the belief is still there for students. I should have a great online school. It should mm. be great. And of course it should. But I think the thing that's held the online education back has been the difficulty of delivering that experience for students. You know, in many ways, online education has been around for 20 years, but we're still in a startup phase of really delivering on the potential of it. Yeah. Yeah. And if you think about it full circle on this conversation, a lot of the skills that educators need are increasingly design skills to mm -hmm. make the online instruction comparable and competitive and compelling enough to win the learner's attention so that it's not just somebody moving their in-person lecture into a Zoom hall and delivering it with less energy. Yeah. And see, instead, it's how do I incorporate yeah. emerging media formats and more mm -hmm. rich experiences as part of what they're delivering? One thing that an, an online institution has, a traditional one doesn't, or maybe they do now, is an instructional design team. So yes. you need to have, I mean, with our courses, every course is a team effort. So there's not just one person. It's creating a course for online is a tremendous amount of work. And if you left that up to an instructor and the instructor was solely responsible for it. It's a terrible responsibility, particularly when you think about the idea that the course needs to continue to be evolve from year to year yeah. to take advantage of, you know, changes in the technology or improvements, in the course or student behavior. Mm -hmm. So you really need team support in order to do that effectively. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's our philosophy. You know, there's an equation for online education, which is a great course plus great instructor equals great experience. Mm -hmm. So you can have a great content and, and that's very important because, you know, in an asynchronous environment, the instructor isn't in front of you. And then also you need to have an instructor who really knows how to communicate online and to sensitively and constructively assess student work and give feedback that's valuable, that's future oriented, that's constructive and mm. uh, actionable on behalf of the student, not just a a summary of where you're at so that you're encouraging students. And then if you can get those two things together, you've got a great class and you, the student comes out of the class wanting to learn more and feeling they've accomplished something. But that's, that is a challenge. And, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of where we are. I mean, I, I tell you the truth, you know, I know this is your hotness part of the show. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm uh, sometimes a little bit of a Luddite about these things because I think the real key is like, do you know what you want to teach? Do you know how to assess what students need to be, need to have learned? Can you make the process of learning fun 
and creative for them mm. so that it feels like a intrinsically something we're getting from. And so those are instructional design and kind of creative things that teachers do. That's not a technology thing at all. That's a yeah. thought process thing on our end. That's our responsibility. Yeah. I like that answer a lot. And I also, you know, just to reinforce your point about learning how to receive and give effective feedback, it's important for creatives. It's important for all of us. It's something I'm still continuing yeah. to work on. And, and I think there's a lot to be learned to your other point about just kicking the tires on some creative endeavors for yourself, because, you mm -hmm. know, it's very difficult to thrive in this day and age if you aren't able to lean into that maker's mindset and actually roll up your sleeves, get your hands dirty, actually try yeah. to build something. And even if it doesn't meet your expectations, yeah. it's still a, you have a place to build from once you, you take that first step. I think every teacher should do something new every year, try to learn something new to, to remind themselves the position that a learner is in. Go take a ballroom dancing class, see how it goes. Yeah. Because then you're, you're, you're reminded of the step-by-step -step process, how you would like to be guided through the early stages of learning something. That's why we teach, you know, people who teach hopefully are folks that want to see people succeed and are inspired by development, by people going from A to B to C. That's what we're trying to do. Gordon Drummond is the president of Sessions College. It's great to connect with colleagues over the years. It's amazing having you on the show. As we're concluding here, you kind of gave us some parting thoughts just then, but any yeah. final thoughts, uh, takeaways for folks? I would say if you're considering a program, consider an online program. We've talked a lot about online education in this, in this call. And maybe like those seniors and juniors, if you're thinking about furthering your education, definitely consider research and carefully evaluate, but consider that online can be a solution for you. Awesome. Think about on, online, think about professional design, the fine arts, flexing your creative skills. That's All right. that's powered by wonderful folks like Gordon Drummond. Gordon, thanks so much for joining me on today's show. Thank you, Mike. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. Hopefully our listeners enjoyed it as much as I did. If you did, please write a review, subscribe, do all the good things. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education. <laughs>